Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Nick and welcome to the first video in the periodontic series, Diagnosis and Examination. In this video, we're going to go over how to diagnose periodontal disease and what to look for in a clinical exam that will help lead to a proper diagnosis. So let's jump into it. Let's start with a review of gingival anatomy. It is important to be able to identify what the gingival anatomic landmarks are in periodontics. Clinically, the gingiva, which is made of this coral pink keratinized tissue, can be differentiated from the red non-keratinized tissue or mucosa. This is separated by a visible mucogingival junction. The free gingival groove refers to the shallow depression that presents on the free gingival surface. When the gingiva is healthy, the free gingiva hugs the tooth tightly. In a diseased state, the gingiva can be recessed. Localized recession to one tooth, as seen here in this photo, can be caused by intraoral piercings. Now between the free gingival groove and the mucogingival junction lies the attached gingiva. This is the portion of keratinized gingiva that is firmly bound or attached to the underlying alveolar bone. It plays an important role in withstanding the mechanical forces of chewing and toothbrushing and in providing stability to the gingival margin. Adequate width of attached gingiva is often considered very important for maintaining periodontal health, especially around restorations and implants. When performing a clinical exam, the gingiva can be described by three C's. The first C is color. Now healthy gums are coral pink, but in disease they become more red or erythematous from increased blood flow, often due to irritation and bacteria. The second C is contour. Healthy gums are scalloped with what's called a knife edge contour. So here, this inner dental papilla, if we were to do a cross section of a knife, this is what it would look like. It would be this scalloped knife edge contour. In a diseased state, they can become edematous, which is to say that they swell and become puffy. The third C is consistency. Healthy gums are consistent in texture. However, in disease, they can be softer due to edema or even stiffer due to fibrosis. And in some cases, they may begin to bleed. This friable gingiva bleeds extremely easily. All right, now let's look at the components of the periodontium. So the periodontium is defined as the supporting structures of a tooth. The periodontium consists of the gingiva, the cementum, the periodontal ligament or PDL, and the alveolar bone. Now an important high yield point to keep in mind is that the PDL consists of type 1 and type 3 collagen fibers, with the majority being type 1 collagen fibers. The next important concept that you should know is biologic width, which can also be referred to by a newer term called supracrestal tissue attachment. So biologic width is the distance between the epithelial attachment at the base of the sulcus and the underlying connective tissue to the alveolar crest. This has been studied to be on average around two millimeters. In other words, teeth require at least two millimeters of biologic width. Biologic width is essential for the preservation of periodontal health and the removal of irritation. If the biologic width is invaded, it can cause inflammation and damage to the periodontium. During a periodontal examination, we examine the health of the gums and the supporting structures of the tooth. We do this by looking for clinical attachment loss, or CAL. This is calculated by using two measurements. Number one is probing depth. Probing depth is the distance from the gingival margin to the base, the pocket. Based on the image here, we can see that four millimeters is the reading on the probe as it is inserted to the base of the pocket. The next measurement is the gingival margin to cemento enamel junction, and that's the distance from the gingival margin to the CEJ. Note that this number is positive if the gingival margin is below the CEJ, which indicates recession. It's negative if the gingival margin is above the CEJ. Clinical attachment loss measures the distance from the cemento enamel junction to the base of the pocket. CAL is the most important assessment tool because it's more comprehensive in that it considers both pocket depth and gingival recession. To calculate the clinical attachment loss, add the probing depth to the gingival margin to CEJ distance. In this example, we can see that we have a probing depth of 4, 4 millimeters, and a gingival margin to CEJ distance of 2 millimeters, which gives us a clinical attachment loss of 6 millimeters. Now we're gonna go over the three states of the periodontium. The first is periodontal health. Periodontal health is when the gingiva and supporting tooth structures are healthy. In periodontal health, there's no inflammation, there's no clinical attachment loss, and there's no underlying bone loss. You should expect to have probing depths ranging from one to three millimeters in a patient with periodontal health. 
The next is gingivitis. Gingivitis is when there's inflammation but no clinical attachment loss or bone loss. Gingivitis starts when the accumulation of bacteria on the tooth surface forms subgingival plaque, which presents a microbial challenge to the host. If this plaque is left too long and not adequately removed through thorough oral hygiene, the inflammatory response in the host is upregulated by the immune system. Gingivitis may progress to periodontitis if the inflammation and infection spreads into the supporting structures of the tooth, including the bone and the connective tissue. The last state is periodontitis, and periodontitis is when there is inflammation, there's measurable clinical attachment loss, and there's underlying bone destruction, which can result in tooth loss as the bone is destroyed. Now that we have gone over periodontal disease, let's talk about how to diagnose gingivitis and periodontitis. A diagnosis of gingivitis consists of probing depths less than 3 millimeters, bleeding on probing in at least 10% of the sites, and sometimes pain. There's going to be redness and swelling of the gingiva because there's inflammation. A diagnosis of periodontitis consists of probing depths greater than 3 millimeters, which means that there's clinical attachment loss, so there's cal of at least 1 millimeter, and there's radiographic bone loss. An increase in probing depth is an indicator of periodontal disease progression in those sites. A key point to remember is that the difference between gingivitis and periodontitis is that there's clinical attachment loss and bone loss only in periodontitis. There are several prognostic factors for periodontitis. A younger patient who has the same periodontal diagnosis as an older patient, for example, has a worse prognosis because of the rate of progression of disease is higher in the younger patient because they got the diagnosis earlier. The presence of biofilm, especially when there are heavy deposits of plaque, can contribute to destruction of supporting periodontal structures. Let's say there's a lack of oral hygiene. This can be problematic because there's an increased presence of biofilm. When plaque is not removed by oral hygiene, it can turn into calculus and facilitate the inflammatory response, which can contribute to further destruction of supporting periodontal structures. Over time, if plaque is not removed, it can harden and become calculus. So calculus is just mineralized dental plaque. If it's above the gums, it's super gingival calculus, which typically presents as a white or yellow in color, while subgingival calculus presents as brown or black in color. A high yield point to know is that the mandibular canine is a tooth that is least likely to be lost due to periodontitis. This is because the canine has the longest root, making it the most resistant to bone loss. In the same idea, the maxillary second molar is the most likely to be lost by periodontitis due to the surface area of these roots. In addition, a high labial frenum, which is a local factor, can exert tension on the gingival margin on mandibular central incisors, leading to gingival recession. This can expose root surfaces and make them more susceptible to plaque accumulation, inflammation, and root caries. Periodontitis is commonly associated with diabetes mellitus. Patients who have diabetes may also present with bleeding on probing and significant bone loss, especially if their diabetes is uncontrolled. Diabetes significantly impacts both periodontitis and periimplantitis by exacerbating their progression and complicating their management. This is a common systemic disease, and it's a major risk factor for both conditions, increasing susceptibility to infection and tissue destruction. One of the key mechanisms diabetes influences is its effect on the inflammatory response of the host. Elevated blood glucose levels lead to an increase in inflammatory cytokines, which enhance tissue breakdown and worsen the progression of periodontitis and periimplantitis. Additionally, diabetes can alter the oral microbiome, promoting the growth of pathogenic bacteria that contribute to infection and inflammation. The disease also heightens oxidative stress, which further damages tissue and impairs healing, making it more difficult to control these infections. Another high yield point to remember is that diabetes inhibits osteoblastic activity, which reduces bone formation and impairs the body's ability to regenerate bone around affected teeth or implants. This leads to increased bone loss and compromised implant success, especially in patients with severe bone loss and bleeding on probing. Overall, poorly controlled diabetes not only accelerates the progression of periodontitis and periimplantitis, but it also complicates their treatment and healing, requiring careful management to mitigate these effects. All right, let's go over some example questions. Number one, each of the following are indicators of periodontitis except one. Which one is the exception? 
A. Gingival inflammation B. Clinical attachment loss C. Pocket depth or D. The presence of calculus Go ahead and pause this video, think this one through, and then resume when you're ready. The correct answer is D, the presence of calculus. So if you have calculus, that's a risk factor for periodontitis, but it's not an indicator of periodontitis. Indicators of periodontitis include gingival inflammation, clinical attachment loss of at least one millimeter, pocket depths greater than four millimeters, and alveolar bone loss. All right, here's another one. So we have a male 65 year old patient with a chief complaint of receding gums. He's a current smoker. He hasn't been in to the dentist in over five years. His oral hygiene appears inconsistent, and he admits to only brushing once a day. Our current findings include generalized gingival inflammation and signs of calculus buildup. This question is asking, what's the clinical attachment loss of tooth number four? And it gives us a probing depth of seven millimeters on tooth number four and a gingival margin to cemento enamel junction distance of three millimeters. Our answer choices include 4 millimeters, 8 millimeters, 10 millimeters, or 12 millimeters. Go ahead, pause the video, think this one through. This should be pretty straightforward. This answer is C, 10 millimeters. So clinical attachment loss is calculated by adding the probing depth to the gingival margin to CEJ distance, which is three. So seven plus three is 10, which is the clinical attachment loss on this tooth. Now, as a reminder, the GM to CEJ distance may be a negative number on your exam. So just add the negative number to the probing depth to get your answer, which is the clinical attachment loss. All right, number three, which is the most likely etiology of localized recession of the mandibular central incisors? A, gingivitis, B, periodontitis, C, a high labial frenum, or D, abrasion? Go ahead and pause this video if you need to. This answer is C, a high labial frenum. If the recession is localized to the mandibular central incisors, this points to a local factor. A high labial frenum is the most likely cause as the mandibular labial frenum is located between the mandibular central incisors, and this is a very common anatomic characteristic that can cause recession. All right, example number four. We have a female patient who's 72 years old with a chief complaint of my tooth bleeds when I floss. She is diabetic with a HbA1c of 7.5%. She's taking metformin and lisinopril. And our current findings include localized recession of tooth number 25 with generalized wear facets and mild xerostomia. Tooth number 25 has a probing depth of two millimeters and it has two millimeters of recession. So what is the most likely periodontal diagnosis here? Go ahead and pause the video and then resume when you're ready. The correct answer here is A, localized gingivitis with recession of number 25. Because the recession is only on 25, the disease is localized to just that tooth. We don't have any other information about the rest of her mouth. And because the probing depth is less than four millimeters, gingivitis is the most appropriate diagnosis. All right, everyone, you made it through the first video of our periodontics video series, Diagnosis and Examination. Here's a summary of some key points that you need to remember on your exam. Go ahead and pause the video, take a few minutes, make sure you understand these points, and I'll catch you in the next video.